While the debate over Muslim refugees dominates much of the political rhetoric here at home, it pales in comparison to the dark backlash spreading across Europe. Europe's migrant crisis is getting worse by the day. A migrant crisis spiraling out of control. A human wave washing over Europe's southern shores. About 100 migrants are missing in the Mediterranean of Libya. Displaced persons have reached 60 million people globally. This means that the UK has voted to leave the European Union. Migration is a fundamental human right. No, no, migration is not a fundamental human right. Are you ready? We will build a great wall along the southern border. Countries from which immigration will be suspended would include places like Syria and Libya. The Arab Spring began here in Tunisia in December 2010. Within days and weeks, the people of Egypt, Yemen, Syria and Libya raised their voices in protest too. This is history. Protesters forcing change earlier this year in Tunisia now succeeding in forcing change in Egypt after nearly 30 years of Mubarak rule. That's two Arab leaders in two months. We turn to the latest powder keg in the Middle East, Syria. A bloody day, at least 75 people were killed during pro-democracy demonstrations. That's where tens of thousands of civilians have fled for their lives, though they still haven't been allowed to cross into safety. The UN Refugee Agency says the number of displaced people across the world has reached over 60 million. Unfortunately, the number in the last year has gone up by 10%. We're now at 65 million people. Two-thirds are internally displaced people, the most difficult to reach. One-third are refugees. 90% are in middle-income countries or in poor countries. 50% of the refugees are children. That means one in every 113 people on the planet is now displaced. Yes, in the media they keep on saying, oh, there are 60 million refugees in the world now. But in fact, if you look at it over the years, and if you compare it to the world population, I mean, there is not a very significant increase in the number of refugees in the world. Over the past two years, what began as a series of peaceful protests against the repressive regime of Bashar al-Assad has turned into a brutal civil war. Over 100,000 people have been killed. Millions have fled the country. When the Arab Spring has actually spread to Syria, many people also thought that it would be a very short-term conflict that will be ended very soon. The dynamics of the Syrian crisis did not allow this. Um, so it was majorly treated as a temporary situation, but as numbers increased, as the tension in Syria continued to escalate, Turkey started receiving more and more people. When you ask someone, which countries do you think of the highest refugee population? They often talk about Germany, Sweden, Canada. We have to thank you, you are home. Thank you. Welcome home. Thank you. If someone knows a little bit more about the conflict, they probably know that it's often the neighboring countries, and they might tell you Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon are hosting a lot of refugees. The UN says there are now one million Syrian refugees in Lebanon, putting a massive strain on an already stretched country. I was United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and during that period, Turkey became the largest refugee hosting country in the world. And I've witnessed the enormous generosity of the Turkish government and the Turkish people opening their borders, their houses and their hearts to their sisters and brothers coming from Syria, but also from many other parts of the world. This crisis is not about the numbers of refugees, numbers of uh, migrants. This crisis is about the unwillingness of the developed nations to host sufficient numbers of refugees, unwillingness of them to share the responsibility. This generosity should be met. This is also the moment to launch an appeal when we see so many borders being closed and when we see so many escaping their responsibilities. This is a moment to appeal for effective burden sharing and to make sure that the integrity of the international refugee protection regime is maintained. Geographically, uh, Syrian displacement impacts very heavily on Europe. And you know, Europe receives a lot of attention. The Greek island of Lesbos on the front line of a wave of immigration that has overwhelmed Europe. As the boats continue to arrive, exhausted volunteers work around the clock. 
because in 2015 many people uh, went to Europe from Turkey by sea. It was almost one million people and it wasn't only Syrians, it was also Afghans, Iranians, Iraqis. And I think this is when we started to call this a refugee crisis because it arrived at the borders of Europe. We don't talk about Yemen, we don't talk about Sudan. I think this is where crisis comes from, the Eurocentrism of the field of migration and asylum actually. If, if you've watched the news at all lately, you cannot have missed what has been happening there. Europe's migrant crisis is getting worse by the day. A migrant crisis spiraling out of control. Hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers are risking everything. A human wave washing over Europe's southern shores. Hundreds of thousands of migrants have streamed into Europe, the largest influx there since the end of World War II. Crisis is the word that people in countries use to describe how they deal with the problem because the word crisis didn't start coming up in mainstream discourse until after migrants started moving en masse to Europe in 2015. I mean, it's not Syrians that are calling it the crisis. Let's say somebody from European Union is coming to talk about the Syrian issue in Turkey and it is immediately about the refugee crisis. But when you are looking at the public authorities' speeches, you see that the Turkish public authorities are very reluctant to present this as a crisis. And that's an interesting comparison because it is actually showing us how rhetoric and discourse can make a change. I guess we are not having the crisis of refugees, but this is nation-state crisis because nation-states and institutions ranging from hospitals to educational systems and labor market had been designed to a constructed, created, homogeneous community. But now these institutions are facing with a really diverse group of refugees and the institutions are actually in crisis sort of to meet the needs of these highly diverse populations. So it's not a refugee crisis, it's the crisis of nation-state institutions. No way, you will not make the Netherlands home. Please don't come, it's risky to come. <laughs> we can't guarantee that you will be accepted here. The Danish government has published these ads and it's telling migrants, don't come to Denmark. There is something unsettling about standing in a square once named after Adolf Hitler and listening to thousands of Germans chant nationalist slogans. <laughs> Four years ago, they founded this new party that is calling itself the Alternative for Germany, which is really, really right-wing. And the center parties are losing votes to this really right-wing party, so they try to change their political attitudes to a little bit more to the right to kind of re-catch their voters. These kind of extreme right-wing parties are pulling the centrist parties to the right as well. I mean, we saw a big radical change in how the media was portraying refugees when Donald Trump was elected. Prior to that, it was just kind of a very, I don't want to say mundane, but it was a much, much less polarized and much less violent perception of who these people were and what they tried to do. One thing doesn't change though, I should underline. Joseph Cairns has this book called Ethics of Migration. And there, there's this passage about a typical American person who would say what about the Jewish people running away from Europe. In that single paragraph, if you change the word Jewish into Syrian and Atlantic Ocean into Aegean, I mean, you could see that that typical American in 2015 turns into a typical European. It is the same rhetoric. So the thing is, I don't think sentiment has actually increased or changed. I mean, a lot of analysts, a lot of people will tell you that nothing actually changed when Donald Trump was elected. People who just previously held these views felt more comfortable in the open. Uh, when we have issues brought up like the Muslim ban, we have the build that wall being chanted at rallies. Build that wall, 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 build that wall. A lot of times it might be overplayed, it might be a little bit exaggerated to the extent of how many people actually feel this way. Uh, when we see media talking about migrants and talking about refugees, we always tend to gravitate towards the most extreme viewpoint. Especially in Europe, media tends to feed into negative public perceptions on, on refugees. Well, of course, the most prominent one that we've been facing is this relation of the migrants and refugees with terrorism. 
I think it's been very bad for Europe. You see the same terror attacks that I do. We see them a lot. A new video surfaces online showing why some are worried Europe is opening its doors to potential terrorists. Now, to be clear, we're not saying that any of those people are terrorists or in any way affiliated with a terror group, but it does highlight just how many of these refugees are Muslim. A lot of people, they think that they're, I don't know, for instance, Syrians are radical Islamist um, extremists. Basically, want to spread Islam all over Europe, you know, like Allah Akbar or whatever. For example, in Turkey, a few years ago, or last year, I think, the Ministry of Interior uh, made a statement showing the very low percentage of Syrians that are being involved in criminal activity. I think this was a very important step. At one point, the, the negative public discourse against Syrians has increased so much in Turkey. For the first time, the Minister of Interior has actually published data about the crime rates, for example. They claim that there are 3.5 million Syrians in Turkey who are registered under a temporary protection regime. In any other country, if you inject 3.5 million people, it would be causing outrage, right? I guess it was Frank Duval from Oxford University, um, who by 2014 said, well, if a similar influx has happened in any other European country, the response would be chaos. In Turkey, this did not really happen. And I think that it was really related to how the public authorities and the media actually contextualize the whole thing. When you are dealing with a mass of people that large, you really want to be a little careful with how you describe them. Unfortunately, David Cameron recently referred to a swarm of people coming across the Mediterranean, and that language matters. This narrative, this crisis narrative that is reinforced by international organizations, by the media, I think it is misleading and it's even self-defeating. Today we are talking about Syrians. In probably 10 years of time, we will be talking about Afghans. Maybe in another decade, it will be a totally different community. So this is not really about a particular nationality, but this is how we are handling this entire issue of migration and mobility in our lives. And this populist rhetoric is not really helping. Imagine you, uh, you had to walk um, all the way from Greece to, to Germany, and as soon as you arrive, somebody will just come and tell you, oh, go back to your country. Most of them have fled countries of conflict. They left all their belongings. Some of them have left even family members behind. They just, they just flee for their, for their own safety, and they, they flee for the, the hope of a better life. Oh, it was so hard because you're, like, you're leaving home, you're leaving your family, you're, all your memories behind. And in a way or another, if we are able to understand how hard it is for a person to uh, leave a place, uh, to leave their comfort zone, abandon everything that is surrounding them and everything that they have, uh, I guess this will really make people understand way more that this is not a choice, this was not a choice, this was something forced. Well, it was an extraordinary moment to witness uh, those people finally uh, being able to get off that boat. They were overjoyed about getting off that boat, but also overjoyed with the idea, with the opportunity of being given a chance to embark on a brand new journey. Oh, <laughs>